So thank you very much. Um, first, I would like to say thank you so much to Legacy Flight Academy for having me on today. It's an amazing opportunity to share um, what I do on the Thunderbirds, who I am, my journey, uh, in hopes to inspire other people or take away some of the lessons I've learned along the way uh, that will be beneficial to everyone who watches this video or attends uh, this virtual engagement. So first, thank you, Le Legacy Flight Academy. For those who do not know, my name is Captain Remo Shea Nelson. I'm Thunderbird 12, the Public Affairs Officer for the United States Air Force Air Demonstration Squadron. For those who do not know who we are, uh, we are the Thunderbirds. Our mission is to recruit, retain, and inspire. So essentially, we are the Air Force's um, premier demonstration squadron. We travel around the United States to showcase the Air Force's capabilities. We represent um, all airmen across the Air Force, and uh, it's an amazing opportunity. And I've learned some extremely valuable lessons um, by joining this team. I am fairly, fairly new to the team. I joined in November of last year. This is my very first season due to uh, COVID-19. I have not had a typical air show season, um, but I have enjoyed my time while I've been on the team. We've been able to accomplish some pretty cool things. Uh, but what I want to share with you all today are just a few uh, lessons learned uh, from my experience on becoming a Thunderbird, uh, being on the team, things I picked up from being in this squadron, uh, being a part of it, learning new things about uh, fighter pilots, things that uh, I think that everyone can apply to the, their lives that will be helpful for them. And so what I'm going to do is um, create, or well, I'm going to share my screen so I can show you my slides really quickly. Um, so my briefing is entitled Life lessons from my Thunderbird journey slash experience. Uh, like I said earlier, my name is Captain Remotion Nelson, and I want to share before I get started in these life lessons, just some um, some background on who I am and where I come from. I'm originally from Douglasville, Georgia. Uh, I was raised by an amazing mother. Um, she was a single parent. She raised me and my two brothers um, most of our lives by herself. Uh, but I still have two awesome dads who were a part of my life, uh, but my mom was very instrumental to my rearing and the woman I am today. Uh, it's important that I share that because she is a huge influence in my life and helped me become the woman I am today. She also helped me see that my current situation, meaning the situation in which we were growing up in, my mom was fairly young when she had me and my two brothers. Uh, and was not able to go to college and pursue those dreams because she was a mother at a very young age. But what she instilled in us was uh, hard work and she provided opportunities for me and my brothers to see past our current situation. And I credit my mom for a lot of the things that a lot of things I've accomplished and the woman I am today. So uh, raised in Douglasville, Georgia by amazing mom um, and uh, two awesome uh, fathers, my biological father and my stepfather. Um, but I went to school in Douglasville. Uh, I did not think that I would be a part of the military. It was not until I met my stepfather who was in the Navy. He is an amazing storyteller. I think that's why I became a public affairs officer because I, my mom would not listen to his stories, but I would, and they would take me to places that I could not imagine things that uh, the rest of my family, meaning my mother's side and my biological father's side of the family had not experienced before. And so his stories took me to his time in the Philippines, took me to his time in Cuba, traveling in the Navy, telling me about everything that he experienced. And it was something that was very motivational to me and something that I really uh, enjoyed listening to. And it kind of created this yearning for more and more of my situation being, you know, in a growing up a low income family um, from government housing to even building our own house through Habitat for Humanity, which is an amazing experience, um, but also things that kind of reared me into who I am today. Um, so my dad introduced me to the Navy, told me about his stories and it interested me in the military. Uh, when I was in high school, I played a lot of sports and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do uh, in college or past high school. And I did not know. At first I wanted to 
um, kind of pursue sports um, because I was naturally very good at it. But it was something that towards my junior and senior year that I kind of lost um, like passion for. So I decided to look at other opportunities. And one of them was uh, the military. My stepfather took me to every recruiter in the world. Uh, and I, he really wanted me to join the Navy. I decided not to. I decided to join the Air Force or look at opportunities for the Air Force. Uh, and one of the things he told me, if, you, if you're going to join the military, uh, I recommend that you go in as an officer, not enlisted, because it's an opportunity for you to lead. Uh, and <laughs> all of, you know, as an enlisted, you are often told what you have to do. You have to follow, follow leaders. And so he wanted me to continue to go through a path of leadership. Uh, and so he kind of pushed me towards looking at opportunities to become an officer in the military. And I was looking at the Air Force Academy. One of my really good friends went to the Naval Academy and I was very interested in applying to those, uh, but it was my cousin who went to Gremlin State University, which is a historical black college and university in Louisiana. Uh, she introduced me to uh, historical black colleges and universities and I absolutely fell in love. And um, my vision shift from being in the military to wanting to go to college and trying to figure out how I could get there uh, and then ultimately merge the two. And one of the things that I found out is that uh, I, I wanted to be an ROTC. There was an avenue to go to college and be in the military. And I found that through Air Force ROTC. So uh, once I finally selected my college, which was Howard University, uh, my freshman year, I signed up for ROTC uh, and I joined a commission through a Detachment 130 at Howard University uh, and became a public affairs officer. Public affairs is uh, not something that I initially wanted to do. Uh, my major in college was speech pathology. I wanted to be a speech pathologist in the military, um, but unfortunately I was not able to do that because of the uh, professional uh, scholarship that they provided for health professionals did not include speech pathology. So they gave me an option of selecting alternatives and my first election was public affairs uh, and I was extremely lucky to get uh, this job. And so from my experience, uh, from selecting public affairs, I was looking at jobs and opportunities. And initially I was selected to be the public affairs officer at Creech Air Force Base, which is down the street from Nellis Air Force Base where I'm currently stationed now. Um, and it was uh, pretty interesting because I was excited to move to Las Vegas, uh, but before I accepted my assignment, there was an opportunity for me to become a diversity recruiter. And so I applied to become a gold bar recruiter, which essentially uh, is a program, one year program for lieutenants who um, obtain the Air Force ROTC scholarship in college and can share and tell uh, other high school or that can share with high school students uh, the opportunity and the process of obtaining the Air Force ROTC high school scholarship. And it had a focus on minorities as one myself. I thought this was an amazing opportunity. So I applied and I was accepted. So my first year I spent in Maryland recruiting. And then after recruiting for one year, I was selected to go back into my career field, which was public affairs. And my first duty assignment was Dover Air Force Base. It's a pretty awesome assignment. I had an opportunity to get exposure to media relations, community relations. I traveled to Afghanistan while I was there on a media escort. And when I was in Afghanistan, it changed how I saw the military uh, because stateside, we focus mostly on training and preparing for uh, wartime operations and then going and being a part of wartime operations for even a week and a half, getting that small window of what it's like to be a part of something bigger than yourself and apply what you're learning and doing stateside to uh, real life, meaning wartime, um, was eye-opening and something I wanted to be a part of. So when I returned from Afghanistan, I immediately uh, looked at opportunities to go overseas and one of the places I could volunteer for was Turkey. I was extremely excited about that because I had studied abroad um, before my senior year in high school, and I mean, in my senior year in college, and I participated in a program called Semester at Sea, which allowed me to be on a huge ship with uh, a thousand other students from across the world, and we traveled to nine countries, um, learning global studies, um, you know, it was amazing learning about the world while main, you know, maintaining some of the core, I think, um, 
taking some of the core classes that uh, I needed to graduate Howard, but also meeting people from diverse backgrounds, seeing the world um, very different than what I ever imagined doing with my life, um, and just kind of just said uh, or showed me when I was younger through his stories and so I was extremely happy uh, to see Turkey on the list because Istanbul was one of the places I visited through semester at sea so I volunteered to go to Turkey I was there for 15 months as a public affairs officer it was pretty interesting we um, had a very interesting experience because that was a time when um, things were kicking off in Syria and there was a lot of tension between Turkey and Syria and so uh, when I was in Turkey, we bed down combat operations, meaning we received F-16s, F-15s, A-10s, we armed our RPAs, and we went to war in Syria. It's a very interesting time, and it changed the way that I see uh, the military, and it kind of, in a way, instilled a sense of pride uh, in being a part of an organization uh, that fights for our freedoms. And so it was a great experience being in Turkey. And then while I was there, I wanted to continue to serve overseas. So I volunteered to go to, um, well, I requested to be selected um, for Ramstein Air Force Base. And I worked at United States Air Forces in Africa, uh, which was also an amazing opportunity. It was two years, I had an opportunity to travel throughout Europe and Africa as a public affairs officer. Uh, multiple assignments, whether it was supporting exercises in Estonia or an African Air Chief Symposium in Botswana, uh, I was able to really hone and produce um, exercises and events uh, that exposed me to international affairs on a national level uh, with the military. And then my Follow-up assignment from there was Korea, but there is a very important piece that I would like to share, and that is one of my biggest lessons learned um, because my, and it was a, a very crucial experience, I think, before I left um, Germany and going to Korea. So when I was overseas, it was a very hard assignment being in Germany. Uh, there were a lot of highs and lows in my career, and I was at a point where I was looking at leaving the Air Force and one of the uh, things that I did was start looking at ways that I could prepare to leave uh, the Air Force. And when I did that, um, I was looking at what opportunities I would pursue outside of the military. And um, I just started to kind of make a list and visualize myself outside of the military. So I was looking at separating. I really was requesting from my leadership to provide opportunities for me to provide opportunities for me to get back stateside so I can look at exiting the military from a stateside location. One of those opportunities I requested was to work at the Pentagon. Um, my assignment officer and my leadership said, hey, it's not the right time for you. We would like for you to go back to be a chief of an office, meaning lead, be another public affairs chief, lead an office. And I had done my stint at Turkey and I felt that I was, uh, I've already completed that, a very high visibility mission. So I decided that I did not want to do that. Uh, and they did not provide any other alternatives for me uh, when it came to leaving Germany or going back stateside. Uh, they were just looking, especially getting to D.C., they were just looking for opportunities for me to lead another office. And personally, that is not what I wanted to do because I wanted to look at potentially getting out of the military. Uh, when I could not find those locations, when they denied my request to go to D.C., and I could not find a position that allowed me to be close to D.C., I decided to, um, I just to look at um another assignment and that assignment was korea so your assignment enjoy traveling i've been over 40 countries at this point going to another country it was only a one-year assignment and it was an isolated assignment it allowed me to really focus on uh, what i want to do and who uh, i wanted to become and i wanted to use that one year to come up with a basic strategy from the military um but what it what it did for me was a little different than what I thought would. And so I wanted to share uh, this photo with you. Are you guys able to see my slide? 
We can burn. Hello? Yes. Perfect. So um, what I wanted to share with you is kind of how I got to this point, and this is me becoming a Thunderbird. And my first life lesson from all of this was life doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you deserve. When I was looking to exit the military, my goal was to essentially go into a nonprofit, uh, a nonprofit sector where I could be a part of an organization that encouraged people like me, meaning coming from low income families, minorities, to pursue their dreams, to go after what it was that they wanted to do, help them reach those goals. Um, while, while I was in Korea, I really focused on that. I started to take public speaking classes. I started to look at organizations uh, that were, that had communication positions that allowed me to be a part of, um, to kind of apply what I learned in the military and be a part of an organization that was already doing that. I also kind of looked at starting a scholarship that would help minorities. So that one year in Korea, I really focused on honing my skills and I became extremely disciplined because I knew that was my one year to get uh, to kind of get it right and figure out what I wanted to do. So when I would turn stateside for my next assignment or when I made a decision to leave the military, I was prepared. But uh, something very interesting happened while I was there and that was the opportunity to join the Thunderbirds. I show this photo because this is me at Squadron Officer School. It's a school that all Air Force officers have to go through, especially when they reach the rank of captain. I attended right before I went to Kunsan. So I attended in, I believe, January of uh, 2018, and I reported uh, to Kunsan, I believe, in June. So I had to attend uh, in, at the beginning of the year, and one of the things I did during my graduation, I asked my friend to take a photo. I had no idea that there was a Thunderbird aircraft behind me. I was not paying attention to it. It was something, it was not something that uh, I was pursuing, I was looking to do. I didn't know anything about the photo, but I think it speaks volumes to how I got to where I am. Uh, at this moment in time, um, I am smiling because I achieved something, meaning I completed a squadron officer school. Um, but I was also looking at leaving the military. And what I wanted to do was leave the military and join an organization that continued to kind of focus on being, um, kind of finding initiatives that were bigger than uh, myself, helping others, motivating others, inspiring others, specifically people of color and from low income families. And I never in a million years thought I would find that in the Air Force, but this photo shows uh, that those are those opportunities and you never know what life is going to present to you. Um, and so for me, at this moment in time where I was smiling, I was also thinking about what my next move was and I was getting ready to go into Korea to kind of focus and be disciplined and prepare for that next move. Little did I know it was going to be being the public affairs officer for the Thunderbirds where I would be a part of the organization that I thought was outside of the Air Force and the entire time it was inside of the Air Force. And so, I thought it was very unique while I was at Kunsan. Uh, I was looking at my next assignment and I told my leadership, hey, I, I made a decision that I would like to leave the Air Force and I wanted to be a part of a different organization. I was looking to work in the nonprofit field. And while I was looking at ways to get out of the military, um, I received a call out for the public, public affairs position for the Thunderbirds. And at that time, I did not know what the Thunderbirds were all about. Um, like it, to its core, I knew who the Thunderbirds were. I knew that they traveled the world. I knew, I thought it was just um, pilots who performed at air shows and that was pretty much it. But little did I know that there was actually a public affairs position. And so uh, my commander said, hey, before you decide to leave, I think you should consider applying for the Thunderbirds because I think that this is what you're looking for in your life and what you're looking to achieve. Uh, I didn't believe it uh, uh, until I started to do research. And so when I researched what the team was all about and exactly uh, what I could do as a public affairs officer, I found that this was exactly what uh, I was not only looking for, but somewhat uh, what I deserved, meaning I spent my one year as a recruiter. Uh, I took this one year to really focus on improving myself as someone who can be in a position to engage individuals, to help them uh, better their situation and inspire them to be their best selves. And in doing so, I was presented with an opportunity that was exactly 
exactly what I was looking for, although I didn't necessarily want it at the beginning. So I think the biggest lesson learned there is life doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you deserve. And sometimes you don't necessarily expect it. Uh, there'll be things that you will go after, meaning I wanted to leave the military, um, but uh, there was something else out there better for me uh, that fit what I was looking for. Although coming into position, I didn't think I deserved this, but after peeling back the layers and understanding what this organization was all about, I felt that I was perfectly aligned in a great place in my career to step into this position. And so um, my next uh, lesson learned from not only I think from my Thunderbird experience is really uh, life is a manifestation of your thoughts and your actions. And I provide that nugget to you guys because when I was applying for the team, when I made a decision that I was going to apply for the team, I did something very, very important uh, that I think that people can apply to their own individual lives. Uh, and that is I started to vision, envision myself already in the position one of the things that I do individually or every day is when I have a goal, I write them down and I put them in places that I will constantly see them. So I keep a list of my goals in my wallet. I have sticky notes on my um, mirror in my bathroom because I wash my face and brush my teeth in the morning before I go to bed. It's something that I will always see. So I put those there specifically because I want to have a constant reminder um, that this is what I want to achieve. And when I say manifestation of your thoughts and your actions, um, one of the things that I started doing, and I'll share with you something that the pilots do here, uh, is something that we call uh, chair flying. It's, it doesn't occur a lot here in the Thunderbirds. It's not a part of our pre-brief, but it's definitely something that's a part of the Blue Angels pre-brief. I have a short video that I'll share with you to kind of understand it, but essentially it's like a learning tool that pilots uh, utilize at all stages of flying and it has a credible impact on their abilities. Uh, in the fighter pilot world here in our squadron is something that we used to do. And one, th one of the things that the Blue Angels still do is that during their pre-brief, they will go over every single maneuver that we're getting, that they're going to perform during the air show. And so we do that as well, but we run down and say it out loud. We say, so our commander will start with, all right, from stepping to the jets, he'll talk through what stepping looks like. He'll He'll talk about getting into the aircraft, he'll talk about takeoff, and then he'll talk about different maneuvers. So he'll say, hey, bake it to the left or bake it to the right. And then the pilots on the left or the right, whatever maneuver they're saying, they will say exactly what they're going to do. And we go over every single maneuver during pre-brief. And I wanna show you kind of what the Blue Angels do. I found the equipment line that kind of explains uh, chair flying and hopefully you get a better idea of what uh Man, no, they got clear skies all day i think they go to you must do during the briefing boss bartlett reviews the maneuvers they'll practice together it involves a rehearsal of the upcoming flight where the pilots visualize what they'll see and hear as they execute each maneuver well the clear for takeoff for the winds check check a park and break off maneuver diamond burner go low transition right turn off sure local department down there you're on 16 let's go that's Come left. Come in further left. A little. Oh. Auto. Everything that we do in the airplane, I say it first. Smoke. Oh. So they listen not only to what I say, but how I say it. Smoke. Up. Push. See the ground. In the brief, we will sit there and go through all the communications every time. A little. Oh. So they can just have it beat into their heads that this is the way Ross Bartlett says, come a left, or says a little pull. Take it in. Smoke on pull. In the airplane, if instead of saying a little pull, I say a little pull, that's different. And they will hear that intonation and go, oh, I guess we're going to get on it a little bit because we might be a little steep or a little low. We're going to right turn the diamond dirty clean flat pass with afterburner drills. Pop. Pop, easing power, easing more power. Just to take that time and spend that amount of brain power executing the flight, closing your eyes, moving your fingers through all the appropriate controls, simulate the power additions, all that stuff. It's invaluable. 
I don't think you could do this if you didn't do that every single day. There's differences in weather, winds, visibility, your mood, all Um, so I wanted to go back to that. If you've never seen cheer flying or if you're not familiar with it, I wanted to kind of show you a visualization of what that looks like. It's something that the Blue Angels do. We do it and we don't necessarily do cheer flying before we fly, but it's something that our pilots practice. Essentially, like you saw in the video, uh, they close their eyes and they start to uh, first say what it is that they're going to do. Uh, and they also focus, as the commander said, on how they say it and they talk through every step. And that is very important in life. Any goals that you have, it is important to see yourself there before you actually get there. I didn't know that I was applying this to my personal life before I joined the Thunderbirds, um, but I thought it was a great parallel and something that I would like to share with you all that I encourage you to do if you haven't started thinking about manifestation and seeing yourself in positions before you actually get there. So one of the things that I did before I finished my applications, before I sent in um, my application, receive all my recommendations. I looked up the Thunderbirds, I did my research, and I looked up Thunderbird 12, and I found a video of Major Derek Lee doing an interview. He was a public affairs officer a few years ago, and he introduced himself as, hello, my name is Major, Major Derek Lee. Uh, I'm Thunderbird 12, the team's public affairs officer. So while I was going through the application process, one of the things that I started to do every morning when I woke up was visualize myself in that position. So I started, before I, I submitted my application, before I received any recommendations, I put a sticky note on my mirror and I put Thunderbird 12. You will be the next Thunderbird 12. And every morning when I woke up, before I left to go to work, I would spend 10 minutes, I would spend five, 10 minutes looking in the mirror, repeating that. Uh, hello, my name is Captain Remoshe Nelson. I'm Thunderbird 12, the team's public affairs officer. What I was doing was envisioning myself already there. I knew that I had done the work. I knew that uh, my records would speak for themselves. But what I wanted to do is provide, um, I think, a sense of self-confidence and kind of visualize myself already there before I actually got there. And so uh, life is a manifestation of your thoughts and your actions. So if there's something that you want to do in life, I am for you and I encourage you to take the time to spend, whether it's two to three minutes a day, to go ahead and talk to yourself, chair fly, close your eyes and envision yourself already there. If you want to become a pilot, if you want to, whatever it is that you want to achieve, spend your time every day thinking about doing that. See yourself, you know, for me it was walking out on stage um, and speaking to a large crowd. For me, it was wearing this uniform. I would just close my eyes and envision myself there. And it was a great reminder that this is something that I can achieve. Not only did I uh, think, have positive thoughts, thoughts about that, um, as the commander said, it's not only what you say, but how you say it. I was very conscious on how I spoke to myself, how I encouraged myself, my inner voice. I made sure that it was very positive and also surrounded myself through the application process around people who believed in me and encouraged me. And so uh, by the time I sent my application off, I felt very confident that it would come back with an invitation. And I was extremely lucky because it did. And I had the opportunity um, to go out and try out. So for those who don't know, it is an extremely difficult process to join this team. Uh, there's several different phases. The first is the application process. Mine was about seven pages. And then uh, the other pieces, they will look at all of the applicants and then pick the top three to five and about invite them out to an air show or an event and they will evaluate you you would have to interview with the 12-man team meaning uh thunderbirds one through 12 you'll sit at a table very similar to what i am and they will go around and ask you a question you have to answer them uh, and then you will also interview with the 57 wing commander who's a one star um, and then you also have to interview with the two-star commander and then from that weekend they will rack and stack their selections and then they have to go up to the chief of staff of the Air Force for approval. So uh, the commander of Air Combat Command, uh, which we fall under being at the 57th wing, has to approve them before they go up to COMAC, um, before they go up to CSAF, the chief of staff of the Air Force. So it is a very long process and it's not an easy one, uh, but what I encourage you to do is people who are looking to, whatever goals you have in life, is just start thinking about yourself already in the position before before you even get there. Because from my experience and from what I see from the pre-brief, from the pilots walking through everything that they do, seeing themselves in that position before they actually do, before they actually get there, um, does wonders to 
uh, your thought process, who you are, your actions, and uh, is extremely beneficial because you kind of start to manifest who you want to be and what you want to do. So uh, my third um, nugget for you all is life is uh, much like flying an aircraft. I, although I've been in the Air Force about eight years and I am to, I, into aviation, I'm a part of aviation, um, I did not know much about flying an aircraft, what it took. It wasn't until I actually uh, had my first, uh, what we call a familiarization flight here that I understood what it's like to be a fighter pilot. Um, but overall in life, I think there's some things that you learn from um, being in the aircraft, understanding how aircraft works that you can apply to your life. One, you are in control of your own life. Uh, there is a machine, life is a machine, uh, but there are things that you can control. And while you're in the jet, you have to focus on those things because there are a lot of things that will come at you that you will not expect in life. Um, and I like to reply, I like to refer to those things as turbulence, meaning you will experience turbulence. Um, from what I've learned from being on this team, there will be bird strikes, which you cannot control, where it's birds running into your aircraft. There will be um, issues with your aircraft. Uh, during one of our flights, we had to have someone, we call RTV back to Nellis, report back to base, meaning you will set out on a goal, something you want to achieve. And along the way, there will be roadblocks and setbacks, something that will make you start over. Uh, but it's so important uh, that you surround yourself with a group of people who encourage you to keep you on a path and you understand that this is a minor setback and every setback is an opportunity for a comeback. So when we look at uh, the situation of reporting back to base where we had aircraft going to fly over the Air Force Academy and one of the pilots having an issue with his jet, he reported back to Nellis Air Force Base. But on his way back, he called uh, our maintenance team and said, hey, we have this issue, this is what I'm seeing. And they were all waiting for him to receive him and to help him get back in the air. So it's important to have good people, uh, to surround yourself by people who encourage you and can help you get back on uh, your path, but also to understanding that you are in control of your own life, you are in control, uh, you are in pretty much in uh, the pilot. So you are controlling that aircraft and you will experience things that you cannot necessarily control, but how you react to it. And so the biggest lesson learned there is like, life is much like flying an aircraft and when you go after your goals, expect to experience some failures, some setbacks. There will be things that you experience that you are not expecting. The most important is that you're resilient and you bounce back. Uh, and the last thing I would like to share with you as far as life lessons that I experience on this team is life is not about uh, perfection, it's about progress. So we, like I explained earlier with the chair flying and the pre-brief, we also debrief uh, every single manu maneuver that we uh, do while performing the demonstration. It's not just uh, the demonstration pilots, but it's also every single officer sits in this uh, debrief and we go over uh, the show. And it's a part of the fighter pilot culture. Um, essentially what they do is they start from, um, we start from the beginning of the show where it's uh, stepping out to the jets, um, getting in the jets, flying the maneuvers from once they land to doing public engagements. Uh, even in the debrief, I will go over how I did as a PA, how PA did uh, for that particular air show. At the beginning, during the pre-brief, something important that I did not know is that we set goals. Uh, during the debrief, we evaluate how we did. And it is a very, I would say you have to have tough skin to sit in a fighter pilot uh, debrief because they look at every maneuver, uh, they go over every radio call, they'll go over every level of detail, um, and they will kind of dev into it and look at its efficiencies and kind of go over some lessons learned and some objectives and discuss uh, things that uh, you can focus on and things you need to improve on. And our goal here at the Thunderbirds, of course, is to showcase the pride, precision, the professionalism of United States Air Force Airmen all across the world. And so we pride ourselves on precision, meaning working extremely hard and putting on a, what we would like to say, near to perfect show for every city we go to. So traveling around the world, uh, some of the factors that we see is definitely fatigue because we're on the road about 245 days out of the year for a normal show season. And so uh, we have a routine and we do it over and over again. Um, but it, there's a lot of factors that we cannot control, uh, but the things we can, we focus on them and we set objectives every time to do our best. And so um, at the end of every performance, we'll go over 
what it is that we were trying to achieve and we will rate ourselves if we did well, if we did not do well in ways that we can improve upon. And uh, that really taught me is that I coming into this thought that I had to be perfect at every little thing that I was trying to achieve as a PAO. This is a very public squadron, uh, meaning that you are performing air shows, our jets are flying as close as 18 inches apart at 500 miles per hour. And it is a very um, scary sight, especially in front of large crowds. And so uh, the crowd can see everything that you do. And so for me, I thought that I had to be perfect at everything, but uh, that is while that is the goal, uh, it's not, um, I guess it's not something that um, we beat ourselves up on if we don't achieve it because it's really about progress. So setting those goals and looking at ways that you can achieve. I selected this photo because it's a photo that's in our, uh, where I'm currently sitting now, our VIP room. Uh, it is a photo of a Thunderbird. And what you cannot see is very close is that uh, this is a very polished Thunderbird and there's one feather that is unpolished. And it's just a simple reminder uh, that you know, none of us are perfect. And while we strive for it, there's always something that we can do or work on to improve to be our best selves. Uh, and so when you set out to achieve your goals, uh, know that you don't have to be perfect in all of it, but you need to learn from each lesson, uh, anything that you set out to do, evaluate it, look at ways that you can improve. And truly you'll see that life is not necessarily about being perfect at these things, but about progress. Um, and then I have a couple additional nuggets um, that I would like to share uh, with everyone. I know it's a very mixed and diverse crowd, but this is mostly what I share for high school students. Oh, sorry, I think I have one question, actually. I don't think I'm able to look at the question. I'm oh, sorry about that, guys. Okay, sorry, I see this. All right, this is from Ricardio. I joined uh, late, so sorry if, if this was answered. Are you the one flying the two-seater, flying the guests that have the luxury of flying with the team? I am not. So I am not a pilot. Uh, I'm the public affairs officer. But the very unique thing about my job is that I'm responsible uh, and I have the amazing responsibility of selecting the individuals who actually get to fly. So what we call them are uh, our media flyers. And so we work with uh, social media influencers, uh, national media outlets, um, celebrities, people of influence. Um, we also target hometown heroes. These are individuals that are part of the community in which we're going to who have done something extraordinary, uh, whether it's a save a life, whether it's being a community leader, um, or it's being teacher of the year. We work with them to give them an opportunity to come into our world, see what we do for a day. And the I think the icing on the cake is definitely flying and what we consider a D model, which is a F6, F-16D. It is a two-seater. And so we have um, 12 Thunderbird officers. Uh, as a public affairs officer, I am responsible for selecting and vetting these individuals and receiving approval from the Pentagon for them to fly. And then Thunderbird 7, uh, who's our director of operations, and Thunderbird 8, who's our advanced pilot and our narrator, they are the two who get to fly our media flyers at our air shows or here at Nellis Air Force Base. Um, and then a couple of things I just want to go over really quickly before I open up for additional questions. These are just eight additional nuggets. Um, because I shared four life lessons, I thought it was very, very important to uh, just round it off to the number 12. So I did uh, add in eight additional nuggets, things that, uh, and I know that some of this crowd is uh, middle and high school, so I thought it was very important to share with you some of the things that I applied uh, early on in life that was beneficial to me. Uh, the first one was just setting goals and go after them with diligence. Whatever you want to do, uh, as I talked about earlier, I still do it today, is write down my goals and I get after it. Uh, we only get one shot at life. And so we cannot control two things, the day we're born and the day we leave this earth. But what we can control is the dash in between and what, we, what life looks like in between the day we were born and the day we leave this earth. So I implore you to use that time wisely. If there's something you want to do, go after it now. Set a goal and start now. Be diligent, be persistent, 
Uh, and so when I was in high school, one of the things that I did was I knew that I wanted to go to college and I started to research, research the colleges that uh, I was very interested in. I started to look at uh, the alumni who attended the college to other students who went to those colleges to understand what it took to get in there. I looked at their admissions requirements and I printed all of that out. And I, what I essentially did was kind of um, develop a physical, uh, I would say, a guide slash roadmap to success. And essentially what that was is this huge binder that had um, every scholarship I wanted to apply to. I went on the website and I printed out the past recipients. I studied what they did, who they are, and what they're all about. I went to every college I wanted to go to. I looked at all of their mission requirements. I looked at how much the school costs. And basically I started at the end goal and I worked all the way backwards, figure out what I need to do to achieve that. And I, this was even my freshman year in college. I mean, my high school is I created a book saying, essentially this is what I want to achieve at the end. And this is what I need to do my freshman year, my sophomore year, my junior year, my senior year in order to get there. And so I implore you, if you are in high school or middle school to look at developing a physical guide or a roadmap to success or anyone who is looking to achieve a goal, I would say, build a physical binder, something that you can go to every day and look at and kind of write out uh, how you can achieve that goal. Uh, utilize your resources. When I was in high school, it's, it's extremely funny. I tell people all the time, one of the people, one of the individuals, the school librarian, and they're like, that doesn't make sense. What do you mean the librarian? How did you even know who your librarian was? Well, the interesting thing about the librarian is they spend most of their day checking in books, checking out books, reading, um, and helping students with literacy. And so what I did was when I, I would go to the library in the morning in high school and go over my papers, one day the librarian asked me if I, if I mind if she looked over and she could provide some feedback. Um, so I basically thought what I gave her what I thought was an amazing essay and she completely like what I do now for my airmen who submit stories to me. I had a lot of red marks come back and like, wow, that's amazing. She had a lot of great suggestions. And so I just started working with her every day to review all of my essays, my recommendation letters. Um, and so that was a resource that was available to me. I also went to my school counselor and worked in, uh, and I was very persistent and I just kept not only utilizing them, the resources that was available to me, but I reached out to individuals who I wanted to be or who I thought could help me and asked them to be my mentor um, and to help me to achieve those things. Uh, the other thing is establishing and maintaining key relationships. I think it's important at every step of your life for middle and high school students. The importance of this is uh, your teachers, uh, your guidance counselors, your coaches, uh, the, peop uh, the adults who are over the organizations you're a part of will play a key part in you achieving your goals, meaning that they will uh, be able to provide a recommendation to whether it's your college, a program, a scholarship for you to get. In order for them to write a good recommendation, uh, you would have to get to know them. And so find people who are key to your life who can speak to uh, who you are and your character, open yourself up, allow them to get to know you for who you are and what you're capable of so they can speak on your behalf. And this is not only for what I did for making good, really, uh, establishing good relationships with my teachers in high school, but this is with my professional career because uh, applying to the Thunderbirds, I required recommendations. This was from previous supervisors, uh, mentors I had to reach out to. Um, and I learned a valuable lesson. Uh, my Because I was a recruiter, I wanted to reach out to my supervisor um, who was my recruiting supervisor. And I reached out, I tried to find him. I had lost contact with him, I had no idea where he was and I thought that was a valuable piece because this job is all about recruiting and the one person who ever saw my uh, assignment as a recruiter uh, was not going to speak on my behalf because I failed to maintain a very key relationship, something that I thought would be beneficial uh, to me later on. And so, uh, but what I did do, I was able to maintain a good relationship with previous commanders uh, and supervisors uh, who could help me um, in this position and write recommendations. Not only like, hey, this is a good individual, but they can truly speak to who I am and what I'm all about. Um, my other tip is to kind of speak experience earlier you want to do. Uh, there is there for you to get your feet wet uh, and don't be scared of uh, volunteerism will teach you a lot and it also humble you. So whatever you want to do, seek experience early. Uh, try to be a part of it. Individuals who are on here now, uh, being a part of a 
uh, virtual engagement like this, listening to other individuals who have been a part of this, I think is essential to what you do, but also finding a mentor or someone who has done it and then trying to work with them or work with an organization that does what it is that you want to do, I think will be extremely valuable uh, with achieving your goals. I talked about this earlier is find mentors and stay connected with them um, because they will help you along the way. The important part of that is finding willing mentors. There are some people who you want to be connected with uh, and I think uh, you would want to be connected with them, but sometimes people are not willing to invest in the amount. I think the time and the knowledge and advice and the counsel that some people need. Um, so find someone who's willing to do that. And not only that, when you look for a mentor, look at ways that you can provide value to them. Uh, it is a two way relationship. That's something I really learned. Uh, one of my mentors who is an 06 taught me that. He said, hey, you know, there's, I'm 06, there's things that I can do for you, what can you do for me? And I had to do some soul search to figure out me as a lieutenant who is coming to this 06 to say, hey, mentor me, show me the way that's going on in the Air Force. Uh, show me how to achieve what you achieved in the Air Force, uh, what I could provide to them. And I realized that this individual was a squadron commander, he's over LTs. I could really understand his airmen. I could tell him the issues that we were facing. I could better help him be a leader. And then also at my age, helping him being in tune with things and issues that we were facing uh, as young officers that would better help him as a commander in leading his squadron. So when you look for a mentor, look at ways that you can provide value to them. It's definitely a two-way relationship. And then for those who are uh, looking to go through Air Force ROTC, I implore you to look up the Air Force ROTC High School Scholarship. It's something that is available to you all. A lot of people do not know about this. People, when they think about joining the Air Force, they think about they have to go through the academy or they have to enlist, but they're actually an opportunity to go to a regular college, something that I wanted to do. I, I visited the uh, academies and they were not uh, what I envisioned for myself. So I looked at um, how I could go to a normal university, specifically a historical black college university, so becoming an officer in the Air Force. Uh, and then recruiting experience, I learned a lot of people did not know about the So uh, the deadline every year is January. Uh, so it's very early at the beginning of the year. And so if you are a junior, you would, uh, or a junior or a senior, you would need to start looking it up now and figure out what you, uh, what's required for you to kind of apply uh, for uh, the high school scholarship. And I can always talk to people offline about it. Uh, I love uh, sharing um, about who have obtained this college. So that's my um, quick brief, or my not necessarily quick, but my brief for today. And so what I'll do now is just open up for questions. Any questions you have for me uh, about uh, Thunderbirds, my Air Force career, things that I experience, uh, I'm willing to share and can answer. Um, for you. All righty, so right now I don't see any questions um, popping up at this moment. Alrighty, so um, since there are no more questions, uh, I will conclude my briefing with you all and just say thank you again for this amazing opportunity just to share some of important lessons in life, uh, some life lessons that I've learned through being a part of, or kind of just my journey to the Thunderbirds, being a part of the team, as well as, oh, I think one question popped up. Oh, sorry. All right, so. <laughs> one of my one of the questions is which what did you most like about the Thunderbirds uh, yes so I as I said I'm fairly new to the team this is my very first year here and what I applied to do is one of the things that I was not actually able to do which is the engagement part so go out and just share uh, my Air Force story as well as the story of other airmen that I've worked with uh, throughout my career and uh, tell uh, the general public about the Air Force and the amazing opportunities. That's one of the things that I really wanted to do. However, I was unable to do that 
because our show season uh, was affected by COVID-19. But the amazing thing about it is with every, um, I, th I think, you know, that also with every challenge is an opportunity. And so uh, one of the things that we looked at is since we're not able to do air shows, what can we do uh, for people during this very tough time in our nation? And so what we um, came up with was uh, we could do flyovers uh, of hospitals and uh, densely populated areas to kind of encourage people uh, to provide a sense of hope during this very tough time. So thus far, my favorite thing that I've, or the one thing that I've liked the most was being a part of uh, America Strong, which was the initiative to fly over hospitals and just um, densely populated areas to bring smiles on uh, the fa faces of the general population, healthcare workers, as well as uh, people, you know, children who are uh, out of school missing their friends. Uh, it was awesome to just see the reaction of people being able to walk outside and look to the skies for, you know, 15 or 20 seconds, see the jets uh, fly by. Uh, that has definitely been the one thing that I've liked the most about being uh, a Thunderbird. Thanks so much, Kenny. <laughs> um, hi, Alicia. What was my dream when uh, I was a kid? It's so funny. Uh, one of the movies that I watched uh, all the time uh, was uh, kind of like Forrest Gump. And so uh, it's so funny because you remember Jenny, she had a very, if you've ever seen the movie, it's a young girl, Jenny. She's uh, Forrest Gump's girlfriend. And she was in a very bad situation. And one of the things she used to like do, or one of the things she, you see in this movie is she runs out to the field and she prays to God to turn her to a bird to fly far, far away far, far away from her situation. Uh, I was not trying to get away from my parents or my situation, but because of my father, my stepfather's influence of telling me about the world and seeing the world, one of the things I always wanted to be, to be was some type of ambassador. Well, I would travel the world and I would always like envision myself it's so corny, uh, but kind of on the phone and traveling saying, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting ready to, <laughs> I'm getting ready to step on a plane to Paris, or I can't talk right now, or I have a conference in South Africa this weekend. And I just wanted to be an ambassador, someone who traveled the world. Uh, I didn't know in what capacity telling what, but now I'm an ambassador in blue as being a member of the Thunderbirds. So I'm living out my dream. And I did that through public affairs because I was able to travel. <laughs> and I remember telling my friend, like, oh, I can't talk right now, I'm getting ready to fly to, I think it was actually uh, uh, Poland. And she was like, okay, that's just something normal that people will say. And I was like, no, it's not, but it, it is my life. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty cool because as a young kid, I would fake having like a little phone saying, oh, sorry, I can't talk right now because this is what I'm doing. So I always dreamed of traveling the world and being, uh, I think, someone who could help, uh, whether it was another country and a situation, be a part of a, a situation or organization that was bigger than themselves. Um, so what is it like being the only female Thunderbird pilot? So I am actually not a pilot. I am the public affairs officer. Uh, we do have a female pilot on our team. Her name is Major Michelle Curran, and she is amazing. Uh, she has shared her story many times. So the good thing about this, and one of the things that I feared, especially coming in uh, as someone who is not in the operator's world, or I don't, uh, had not been in a very, uh, like embedded into a fighter squadron. I was at Kunsan, Kunsan Air Base uh, in Korea, which is uh, a fighter base, and I got to know fighter pilots, but there's a particular culture that comes with fighter pilots. And so I had met fighter pilots, worked with them, but I had not been embedded in the squadron in a way that I felt very comfortable walking into this team. But the one thing that I enjoyed the most, I see here, um, the moment I stepped and I put on this uniform and I um, stepped into this position, everyone was extremely welcoming. Uh, this is an environment where people will push you to be your best. Uh, the expectation, of course, is uh, for you to display excellence in all you do, uh, just like any other organization in the Air Force. Uh, so being in this position, whether it's a only Black female officer or um, Michelle being the only female Thunderbird, I think it provides a unique opportunity because we can speak to people who look like us, us and encourage them to be, uh, to strive to be and not only in a position, not only the position that we're in, but in a, position, a higher position that we're in to be better than who we are, uh, but also uh, to encourage them to strive uh, to achieve their dreams and let them know that it's possible. I think it's very important for you to see, not if you don't, if you're 
not only can you do you visualize yourself in a position, but see people who have been in that position to know that it's possible. So um, I enjoy uh, being who I am. I'm embracing uh, this new title that I recently received as the only black female or the first black female Thunderbird. Um, and I hope that I can use this amazing opportunity to encourage young girls who look like me, who come from situations similar to me, to, to be their best. Uh, hopefully we can get a black female pilot uh, on the team one day, uh, and hopefully I can meet her on the crowd line. Uh, and so that would be awesome. So it is uh, an honor to be uh, one of the only female Thunderbird uh, officers on this team, uh, but also an amazing opportunity. Um, what did you want to be uh, when you grew up or what do you want to be when you, oh, what do I want to be when I grew up? Uh, I still haven't figured that out yet. I, I would like to continue to just be a part of an organization that um, helps other individuals, uh, being a part of something that's greater than myself. Um, and what I want to do is seek goodwill, do things that uh, kind of improve any organization, any individual, uh, be a part of something that breeds positive positivity and light to others individuals so that is my goal i can't tell you in what form or fashion that looks like uh, i didn't think that that looks like what i do today uh, but it definitely does so i don't know exactly what i want to be when i grow up <laughs> but um hopefully i figure it out very soon um yeah i think that's pretty much all of the questions uh, there is one about uh challenging being a thunderbird pilot uh, again, I am not a pilot. I am a public affairs officer. Um, another question. Uh, do you feel like being a public affairs officer is stressful? If so, what's some of the ways you handle the stress? Uh, I absolutely think that being a public affairs officer uh, brings a lot of stress to your life. Um, one of the, There was a tour earlier here in the squadron with some lieutenants, uh, and one of the pilots said, you know, and I was very uh, thankful for the comment is that um, surprisingly one of the most stressful and important jobs on this team is because pilots, uh, what they do is kind of show up um, and, and fly the demonstrations, but there's so much that goes into it before that. Uh, me and the advanced pilot work very close together. Uh, one, making sure that everything is good to go to receive the team, setting up public engagement, setting up uh, community engagements, whether it's school visits, whether it's uh, working with um, make a wish kids where we're visiting them, signing autographs, um, where we're, you know, finding an opportunity to go out to the recruiting booth and speak to students, meeting with uh, city officials. These are all the things that my office is responsible for. Uh, I'm extremely thankful because I have six amazing airmen, public affairs professionals on my team who helped me uh, with this. And so I'm honored to have them, um, but at times it does get a very stressful, um, America Strong was extremely stressful because we had not done anything like that before. Uh, the level in which I was operating, which my team was operating, was uh, more than what we expected when it came to public affairs, working with uh, national media engagements, uh, being in a very public eye, flying over high visibility, high visibility cities, uh, being New York, DC, LA, where all eyes were on you. Uh, the messaging had to be right before we went into those cities. And so it was a lot of stress working, not only with the, within the squadron, city officials, but higher headquarters to approve us to do that. Uh, so it was very difficult and hard. Uh, what do I do to handle these stress? Um, I have a have two phones. Uh, I have, um, I would say, our schedule has changed, but the few days that we actually get off, I turn off the phones. Uh, I have established a group of friends who uh, know very little about what I do and who are not connected to the Thunderbirds, who are not connected to the Air Force, um, but we are connected in other ways, uh, meaning that we enjoy to do so we enjoy doing social things. So I get I disconnect completely from um, my work. Uh, I turn off my phone. I hang out with friends who just enjoy similar things that I do. Uh, I am huge in meditation um, before coming to uh, Nellis Air Force Base, excuse me, I went on a wellness retreat. I traveled uh, to three countries in uh, Asia, and part of that was a wellness retreat where I learned to meditate uh, and journal, and those are things that I continue to do, especially when uh, things are stressful for me. So I completely disconnect. Uh, I meditate, I journal, and I hang out with people who are not connected to work. Uh, is it challenging speaking in front of people? Absolutely, I think so. Uh, 
it is very challenging um, because you want to make sure that the messaging that you're sharing with them resonates with them, connects with them. And then you, they're all eyes on you. So people are looking at you, uh, expecting to hear something great from you, and you want to deliver that message. You want to do it well. I think there are a lot of are afraid of uh, people, you know, judging them. They're afraid of people, um, uh, their opinions of them. They're afraid that they may not uh, say something correctly. Um, but uh, what every challenge, again, is an opportunity. So I don't necessarily, I look at it as a challenge, of course, but also look at it as an opportunity to go out and accomplish a goal or a fear. And I tell people all the time, uh, the one thing that you do that makes you uncomfortable, if you find yourself uncomfortable in a situation, especially when you're going after your goals, you're exactly where you need to, need to be. Uh, and at any point, should you, be, should you feel comfortable? So put yourself in a situation, get comfortable with feeling and being uncomfortable being on this uh, virtual engagement is uncomfortable for me, uh, but it's a great opportunity because hopefully I can share something that inspires someone else or educate someone. Uh, and then uh, also too, it's a great opportunity for me to learn. I will review this tape and go over things that I did well, things I need to improve. I will request feedback from you all. Uh, so it can be uh, challenging, but also it can be an opportunity. Uh, have you made a book? No, I have not, Lee Shy. But if you have any suggestions on uh, what type of book I should write uh, or things that uh, young uh, kids like you are looking for, I'm all ears and I'm open to hearing uh, what you guys are looking for. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the questions is if you want a career change, how do you become a member of the Thunderbirds? Um, it really just depends on where you are in your life. If you're already in the Air Force, there are certain, you know, there are about 28 or so AFSCs uh, on, on this job. So uh, there are uh, specific positions uh, or career fields uh, that you have to be in in order to join the Thunderbirds. So one, do your research, uh, figure out what those are. They're all on our website. Um, and then look at the requirements and, and just apply. Uh, to those and then if you are not in the Air Force first, you must join the Air Force in order to become a member of the Thunderbirds. So I think I've ran over my time. I think I'm five minutes over. Thank you all for the questions. And again, thank you to Legacy Flight Academy for uh, hosting this event and providing this platform for me to share my story, some of the very important lessons I've learned along the way and some of the important uh, tips and, and that I can share uh, with you all. And I hope uh, someone picked up or learned something today from uh, this engagement. So thank you again uh, for this opportunity. And unless anyone has any other questions, I will be logging off.